In the last years, we've heard a lot of different stories and a lot of different announcements in regards to quantum computing. The idea that's supposed to completely revolutionize the computers as we know today. But the idea that even today is still kind of struggling to find any practical use or to even create something useful outside of a complex machine that's able to solve just a handful of complex mathematical equations. In other words, despite all of the hype and all of the announcements, at least for now, quantum computing is still just an experiment that seems to be kind of cool and seems to work, but does not really have a very good practical use. But when it comes to innovative computing ideas, or essentially completely new types of computers, quantum computing is not the only contender. On almost completely opposite scale, we have the idea of biological computers. Or essentially the idea behind biochemistry driving most of the mathematical computations. And though it might sound kind of far-fetched, it's actually been in existence for over three decades, with some of the recent announcements basically taking us to a completely new level. As we're going to discuss today, based on this recent study, we actually could be entering a new era of what scientists refer to as DNA-based programming, or basically DNA computers. And though by itself, once again, it might sound kind of far-fetched, it really isn't. I mean, just look in the mirror. You and I are some of the most complex biochemical computers slash robots in existence on planet Earth. And so this is definitely physically possible. But the question is, of course, can we control it? Can we turn it into an actual computer? And can this become practical? And honestly, the answers to all of these questions, at least for now, are it's not clear. But this is exactly what these new studies are about. But as I mentioned, this is not a new concept. As a matter of fact, the original experiment that tried to show that this is possible was back in 1994. Leonard Edelman that you see right here presented the first prototype of a DNA computer known as TT100, where he basically used a tiny tube filled with 100 microliters of DNA to solve one of the basic mathematical problems, Hamiltonian path, a type of a path optimization problem meant to establish connections for the shortest path possible. It was successful back in 1994. And this was actually the first application of DNA to mathematical problems. A very similar approach in 2002 was able to solve even more mathematical problems, including three well-known SAT problems that actually had 20 mathematical variables in them. And so even by early 2000s, these very simple DNA biochemical procedures were able to physically solve mathematical problems that we normally use computers for. Although obviously here, it was all based on biochemistry and chemical reactions, and molecular biology as the main hardware. But the main problem here was of course twofold. First, this was relatively slow. A lot of these reactions would often take hours or maybe even days to complete, meaning that to solve the problem you do require a lot more time. Which is practically the opposite approach from quantum computing where usually the results are almost instant. And the other main problem here was the analysis. It obviously takes a long while to get the results. There is no direct biological screen to tell you right away what actually happened. Or at least not yet. But this was a good start. It looked like we could use biological systems for very similar mathematical calculations to a typical computer. But it wasn't really until the last few years that we started seeing some major advances. Mostly because of major advances in genetic modification, including of course the famous CRISPR. One of the first intriguing announcements back in 2016 was the breakthrough in information storage. A team of scientists was able to encode four separate images into strings of DNA by converting digital data into four basic elements of DNA molecules, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And so essentially they were able to store huge amounts of data in a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of DNA present inside this pipette, proving that DNA can serve as an ultra high density storage for all sorts of data. But once again, the encoding and decoding was not very fast. Here the process took approximately 100 hours. But that's at first. Eventually scientists realized that you can actually do tiny strands all at once in different locations. And this dramatically opens up the doors for DNA computing. By providing correct instructions to different sequences, you can dramatically speed up performance 
by millions or even billions of times, essentially creating a biological parallel computer, dramatically increasing the performance of these mathematical solutions by using just a tiny tiny fraction of energy of a typical classical computer, or more importantly, a quantum computer. Here you have a tiny setup that's essentially just one pipette, with all of this happening all at once, all of this running by itself with just a tiny tiny amount of energy, and producing relatively accurate results. And so in the last few years, this definitely formed really really exciting opportunities. But now we have a very big breakthrough. The world's first DIC, DNA Integrated Circuit. Something that's supposed to have a much more general purpose, and that's not just going to be useful for specific mathematical solutions. And something that's essentially a liquid DNA computer. A directly programmable biological device that allows us to apply various algorithms similar to a classical computer, and most importantly, allows for scalability and thus increased speed. With the theory already presenting a possibility for up to 100 billion different circuits running in a similar way to a typical computer. And so in this case, if you look at the picture, it resembles a typical gate array. A type of a specific integrated circuit that was extremely popular in the 80s and in the 90s for a lot of early computers and early electronic devices. Here though, each of these short DNA segments essentially create larger structures able to use molecular instructions in the same way that electricity controls the circuit. With the first experiment already showing that you can solve quadratic equations through a very simple chemical reaction that transforms the circuit inside. With one of the most important achievements here being the fact that there is really no loss of signal no matter how big the structure is. And so here no signal attenuation is required at all because these chemical reactions do not produce any kind of a loss. And so even by producing a large enough machine, it's possible to create something that's 100% efficient. And though obviously this is still just a proof of concept, and we're not going to be able to produce anything like this just yet, the ability to create these large DNA networks that are able to be very efficient, very small in size, and require almost no energy, if scaled to a large enough size, in theory, can definitely outcompete classical computers. But this is just the first step. Here they only used 30 different logic gates and only 500 DNA strands. But even this really tiny system was able to solve quadratic equations, providing the correct answer. And so there's quite a lot of potential here. Assuming this can be scaled up and assuming this can be actually developed into something that's easy to implement, at least in theory, it could lead to some innovations in biological computers with one of the biggest potential being biological sciences. Here the implication can be that you could use these computers to directly classify various viral or bacterial pathogens by running them through this biological computer without the use of anything else. Although here once again we have to be a little bit careful. Just like with a lot of other grandiose announcements in the last few years, for all we know maybe this is as far as it gets. We still don't really know if this is going to be possible practically or if anyone is going to find a way to scale these computers to much larger proportions or more importantly if they're actually going to work at all. For example what if just like the biological tissue all of these computers require specific temperatures, specific pressures and very specific pH. Or what if your biological computer gets sick? What happens then? Is it going to provide you with completely wrong results or is it just going to die? So still definitely a lot of questions to answer, but a pretty exciting new discovery. We'll of course see where all of this goes in the next few years. Until then, check out some of the other links on DNA computing in the description below, as well as some of the links on quantum computing as well. Once there are some additional discoveries or someone manages to create something really incredible out of this, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.